So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the opening of the National Placement Evaluation Centre. Um, my name is Fiona Stoker. I'm the uh, Managing Director of Health Education Services Australia, also known as HESA. And I'm also the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Accreditation Council, um, as you all um, knowingly love and map. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the um, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Welcome to, to everybody. Um, I particularly um, like to welcome, I'd like to welcome you all, but I, I would like to particularly mention just a few people. Um, Ross Jackson is the Chair of Health Education Services Australia, um, the HESA Board, and Mr Ian Frank, who is a Director of HESA, Professor Karen Strickland, Chair of the Deans of Nursing and Midwifery, Professor Shane Thomas, who is the Associate Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Federation University, um, and Anthony Dobkins, who's representing the Chief Nurse and Midwifery Officers. And um, we've got an apology from the Chair of the Deans of Health, um, Esther May. Um, so I'll go on to the relations because um, I just want to explain a little bit about the relationship that we, we, um, that we have because um, I'm not sure whether people are aware that Health Education Services Australia is actually a subsidiary company of the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Accreditation Council and supports the contribution that um, Health Education Services has provided to MPEC over the next three years. I'd also like to acknowledge the support and funding of uh, MPEC from the Council of Deans of Nursing and Midwifery, um, ANZ, known as the CDNM for this year, and the excellent relationship that HESA has with the Council of Deans of Nursing and Midwifery and the relationship that we've established over the past year with HESA. Thank you also to Federation University for being the center's service provider. Um, okay, we'll go on to housekeeping. The, um, your cameras and mute are automatically off. The, there's a question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. Can you please post your questions to a member of the, of the panel? And these will be addressed at the end of the session. There's also a recording of the webinar, which will be circulated in the post event communications. And please tweet and use the handle um, hashtag NPEC. The order of proceedings uh, we've got a um an amazing range of speakers tonight uh in professor simon cooper professor karen strickland uh megan fitzgerald anthony and uh also myself uh so without um further ado we'll go on to professor simon cooper uh, Simon is the director of the National Placement Evaluation Centre. He's also the co-director of, of the Health Innovation and Transformation Centre at Federation University. Welcome, Simon, and please take it away. Thank you, Fiona. Great to see you all here this evening. Um, and on to the first slide, please, Sabrina. 
Um, welcome to the National Placement Evaluation Centre, everybody. I just checked my records and it's actually four years since we started the foundation work for this. So congratulations to all the team for to getting us to this important evening today, the formal opening of the centre. Just as a brief run through, <coughs> the core team is made up of myself, Deputy De Director is Karen Strickland, who's on this call, and Colleen Ryan is our Assistant Director. Our Senior Midwife Advisor is Di Bloxham. Our Interprofessional Learning Advisor is Professor Fiona Bogosian. We have early career researchers, Elise Luders and Linda Hughes. Uh, our Industry Advisors, thanks very much guys for your work so far with this. It's been great help to have your input, is Christine Doral and Sam Moses. Um, you're here from our third year student rep who's been with us for the last two or three years as the next speaker, I think. That's Megan Fitzgerald. We have a full time PhD student, Peter Stelfox, who's um, uh, just started his work with us, which is great to have him on board. Um, sincere thanks to our um, uh, uh, employed staff, Robin Kant, Michelle Mayer, and most importantly, Reuben Hotmans, who I want to acknowledge for all his hard work to date in the software development for this uh, center. The advisory group also thank you to them, currently deans of nursing and their, and their representatives from 19 Australian schools of nursing and midwifery, our indigenous advisors, industry and student representation. And again, my thanks to governance committee, Roz, Fiona, Ian and Karen. Next slide, please, Sabrina. Okay, so what's the background? I'll run you through a little bit of background to the development of the centre. Um, entry to practice nursing and midwifery placement experiences vary across Australia with both positive and less than optimal outcomes. A nationally consistent approach to understand and measure the quality of clinical placements is essential in line with, for example, the recent nursing education report by Schwartz. So what's the aim of the centre? The aim is to enhance the quality of cl clinical placements in Australia. What have been our objectives to date? To develop a feasible, valid and reliable clinical placement evaluation tool for students and educators. Just note here that the aim was always to produce generic tools that could be used across the health professions. Secondly, to develop the framework and to commission a sustainable national placement evaluation centre. These first two have been achieved as of tonight and to review all Australian clinical placements for national benchmarking and quality improvement in line with ANMAC accreditation standards incorporating nursing, midwifery students and clinical educators evaluations of placements. And next slide, thanks Sabrina. In phase one, um, a few years ago now, we developed a survey tool to enable students to rate clinical placements and this was named the, uh, the uh, Placement Evaluation Tool, or PET for short. The PET was originally piloted with 1,200 nursing students at six universities and one TAFE across all year groups with good validity and reliability outcomes. The tool enables rating of uh, the clinical environment and the level of learning support and includes 20 items which can be rapidly completed after placement. This is important, obviously, it's, it's important that pe can people can complete these surveys quickly on their phones. From this initial survey, students report high levels of satisfaction, um, but approximately 11% raised concerns about staff attitudes to students, which was at times negative. The environment, which was at times reported as unsafe, and lifestyle concerns relating to placement costs for students. The take home message here on that last bullet point is that the majority of students have a really good time in Australia. 90% um, have a good experience, but there's around 10 or 11% where we need to do some further work. Thanks, Sabrina, next one. Also in phase two and three, we developed the website. You can go to that now if you, um, or anytime you like which includes links to key educational resources, noting the need to produce new interactive materials, which we'll be doing over the next few years. Um, if should you want to uh, look at any of the tools, you can download those tools at any time. The placement evaluation tool, the nursing student version is the validated one I've just spoken about. 
There's also trial versions of Pet Supervisor, which is industry educators rating of their placements to, to enable us to triangulate outcomes. And there's also our pet middle free student trial version that's also available should you want to have a look at it. There's optional assessments that um, uh, industry or universities may want to use at any time. There's a patient safety questionnaire there. And there's um, a an, uh, more detailed midwifery assessment tool called MidStep with the link posted in front of you. Next slide, please. Um, also in phase two and three, we spent um, some considerable time setting up the legal arrangements for this new national center, with the development of the terms of use and transfer of ownership of MPEC to HESA, which Fiona mentioned earlier. Um, we have ethical exemption from the University of Wollongong for the QI parts of the work that we are doing. So universities don't need to apply for ethics approval in order to submit forms and for students to do evaluations. We've also developed the education management system to enable institutional reporting for universities and clinical partners, which includes national summaries. And next slide, Sabrina. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the website as it looks today. Um, and if you are a registered user or a registered educator, you'll be able to look at the ratings of your students at any time uh, with, for example, the bar graph on the right shows overall satisfaction ratings. And next slide, please. So what data will be available? Um, and how will MPEC report? Institutions can only access their own student reports, which includes the online summaries as in the previous slide, and they can download a detailed Excel spreadsheet whenever they want to. The National Centre will provide de-identified national reports. Um, students will always be identified, uh, de-identified throughout. Um, university clinical coordinators are sent an alert when ratings are less than satisfactory and quality improvements will be supported at a local level in line with national benchmarking. And next slide, thanks. So in conclusion from my lead in, the MPEC is only the second centre of its kind after NHS Scotland, who opened their national evaluation centre a couple of years ago. So Australia are ahead of the game with this. Ownership and hosting of the MPEC is with the Health Education Services Australia or HESA to ensure data protection, the nexus between universities and industry, independence and ongoing sustainability of the centre, if I can say the word. Uh, members include all 39 nursing and midwifery schools and their clinical partners. A systems trial with nursing and midwifery students will continue for the remainder of this year and we'll have a rollout, uh, a full uh, rollout from the start of 2023 when students go back on placement. What have we been doing for future plans and thinking about for future plans? We would expect a rollout to all enrolled nurses um, within the next year or so. Um, we've already had international translations of the PET tool uh, so far into Norwegian, and we're talking with colleagues in New Zealand about a national trial with nursing students in New Zealand. Um, we would anticipate the use of PET across all health professions um, in the long term, physio, OT, speech and language, speech and language for example, enabling, enabling multi-professional evaluations across the whole country. And next slide, please. Um, my sincere thanks to uh, Professor Tra uh, Tracy Maroney, who was the former chair of the Council of Deans of Nursing Midwifery and initiated this project in the first instance. Um, thanks also to Professor Fiona Stoker, who's here today, Georgina Farha and the HESA board. Um, also to Karen Strickland and Colleen Ryan, who are my co-directors, Special mention to Colleen because she's been poorly recently and she's just got home from hospital and will be watching this at the moment. Um, uh, the NPEG advisory committee from 19 universities 
and the VIPs and attendees for this evening's event. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you. If you want any publications uh, or any links to the publications are listed on the site. Uh, back to you, Fiona. Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Karen Strickland, who is the Chair of the Council of Deans of Nursing and Midwifery Australia and New Zealand. She's also the co-director of NPEC, uh, the Executive Dean of the School of Nursing and Midwifery and Edith Cowan University. Um, so welcome, Karen, and uh, off you go. Okay, thank you, Fiona. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Wajal Cape and Southern Nunar region of Nunar Buja, and I pay my respects to the Nunar elders past, present, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. So the Council of Deans is the peak body for nursing and midwifery higher education schools, and it provides strategic leadership for its members representing the interests of nursing, and midwifery education, workforce development, practice and research. And at the heart of what we do is producing high quality nurses and midwives with a strong evidence base that informs the best clinical outcomes for patients and our communities, impacting on the health outcomes of our nations. So as Simon said, uh, it's been four years, this, this centre has been four years in the making and in 2018, the Council of Deans of Nursing uh, set out a strategic action plan that was inspired and led by the former chair of council, Professor Trini Maroney. And I'd also like to thank Tracy for her leadership and the executive of that time for supporting the development of the centre. A key strategic priority of council at that time was really to improve and evaluate the quality of clinical learning and environments uh, for students who were on clinical placements. Clinical placements are an integral part, in fact, a signature pedagogy of nursing and midwifery education. And, you know, our recent uh, Educating the Nurse of the Future report highlighted clinical placements uh, as, a, as a key key aspect of professional learning. And we're committed to the notion that our students add value to the clinical setting when on placement. And councils, uh, other sponsored research that was led by Professor Marie Gertz highlights the value add that our students make to clinical placements. We very much see our, our students as a shared outcome with our clinical um, industry partners and the chief nurse and midwifery officers. Um, so that actually, the, you know, the students that we produce are only as good as the education we provide and also the clinical placements. So with this in mind, it was really decided to commission this major body of work to develop the tool, which is um, you know, grounded in research and evidence, and then to uh, develop the National Centre to monitor the quality of the clinical placements. Um, and it's through um, you know, Professor Simon uh, Cooper's leadership and the core team um, that really has brought this to fruition today. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with you sharing um, this uh, launch event. And that's all I've really got to say. So I'll hand over to the next person. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. And uh, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Megan Fitzgerald. Um, this is a student's view of clinical placement, as Megan is a Bachelor of Nursing student at Federation University. She's also been the nursing student representative um, at the National Placement Evaluation Centre. So take it away, Megan. Thank you, Fiona. I'm a final year undergraduate Bachelor of Nursing student at Federation University. I accepted an invitation so I could represent the nursing students with the National Evalu Placement Evaluation Centre and contribute to the centre's aims 
to improve the quality of clinical experiences. As student nurses, we are constantly being assessed and evaluated. And I've always believed it's important for nursing students to evaluate their clinical placements so that education providers and host organisations can work with us to ensure we enjoy safe and supportive environments and are provided with appropriate learning opportunities. This is how we will achieve the learning objectives that, were, that are required and progress in gaining competencies to become graduate nurses. Over the last three years, I've been left unsupervised I've been expected to work as a qualified staff member and concernedly preceptors have reported and shared that they don't really understand their role. This is dangerous practice, placing students, patients and staff at risk. I've also worked with staff who were supportive and welcoming and preceptors who did understand their role. And during those placements, I was adequately supervised, provided with quality clinical education new learning opportunities, had opportunities to cement learned nursing skills and encouraged to think critically. This meant I was able to provide evidence-based nursing care under hospital policies and procedures. This is what every nursing student should experience on every clinical placement. Support, education, and developing confidence in gaining quality nursing skills. Experiences like this will enable nursing students to feel confident in gaining quality nursing skills, sorry, experiences will make us feel confident and develop competence in preparation for entering the workforce as new graduate nurses. While I can't speak for all students, I'm sure many would agree with me that positive clinical experiences makes us very excited for a career as a registered nurse. In thinking about my two different preceptoring experiences, I strongly believe the difference is directly related to the recruitment to the role and the quality of preceptor education at different facilities. We need more consistency in this regard. The National Placement Evaluation Centre has already done so much to improve clinical learning for Australian nurses. The placement evaluation tool is vital for all concerned to understand how we can improve clinical learning. The placement evaluation tool, <clears throat> excuse me, is easy to use. It takes under two minutes to complete and the questions relate really well to clinical placement. I've seen some of the data analysis when the group was testing the trial site. The clinical facilitators and organisations, it's going to really help them understand the student's experience so they can review areas needing improvement. I believe the placement evaluation tool and centre under the direction of Professor Cooper will not only improve the quality of clinical placements, but will also improve the quality of and confidence of preceptors and new graduate nurses. Thank you. I'll hand back to you, Fiona. Thank you, Megan. Um, it's, uh, it's always such a joy to hear from, from the students that we're, um, we're teaching and progressing through their education to, to become registered nurses. So thank you very much, Megan. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, An Anthony Dobkins, who is the ACT Health Chief Nursing and Mid Midwifery Officer to speak about the clinical benefits of workplace education. Over to you, Anthony. Look, good evening and thank you for having me present today. And and I, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on where we meet, elders past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members at this forum. I'm the ACT Health Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer, and I think this initiative is exciting as the, uh, the, our future of nursing and, and midwifery is um, with the students. And I believe that they have really shown 
their beauty, skill and talent during uh, COVID-19 when they became an integral part of the workforce. So um, I'm, I'm very privileged and very excited to be a part of this initiative. Next slide. Um, establish what the definition is for workplace-based learning. It's also termed as situational learning, may be defined as a learning experience which allows students to learn through supervised application of their professional roles in real workplace settings. This concept embraces work integrated learning that creates opportunities for impactful and effective education by extending beyond the walls of a lecture room or seminar room within the clinical setting. Next slide, thank you. It is well documented that uh, the benefits for the student can be viewed as explore firsthand the world of work, gain job ready skills and knowledge, practice academic and industry specific skills, identify career options and pathways, be inspired by new work opportunities, exposure to alternate models of care, be an active member of the healthcare team, a greater appreciation of the healthcare industry, and I believe this is the beginning of lifelong learning as a profession. The next slide, thank you. For the healthcare environment, the benefits can be seen as students may offer a fresh, different evidence-based perspective that informs the client care. Students may bring greater diversity and representation to the treating team. Students may offer additional services or allow for more intense interventions. And for the healthcare environment, consumers, family and carers may benefit from sharing their lived experience to inform students' perceptions and assist to shape the future health workforce. Thank you. Is that will enable further development of personal clinical, clinical reasoning, communication, supervision and leadership skills, personal satisfaction with educating the future health workforce, they assist with career progression through the demonstration of high level knowledge and skills, and may assist with in keeping one up to date with the latest evidence-based practice and facilitate one's own. I think the greatest benefit of um, students and workplace learning is that for the team. The student may undertake projects, quality assurance activities, research that can be of value for the team. Students may be involved in developing enough team. Student supervision maintains a relationship with the university, which may involve access to professional development and the library, participation in on-campus learning and involvement in research. Student placements can enable an evaluation of the suitability of students for future employment in the team or organisation. When recent studies are, are employed on their placement sites, they can hit the floor running. And students may enhance staff collaborative teamwork within and across the profession. Next slide, thank you. In closing, I think it is vital that industry and our academic partners have a close relationship to support and enhance the um, clinical placement for students. And within the ACT Chief Nursing and Midwifery Office, that holds and coordinates the clinical placement office for students across the territory. We have an industry partner meeting, and I think this is important to ensure transparency of communication where we can discuss the curriculum, but the major focus is on the student and the experience. So the role and the function of the industry partner meeting is to share information between ACT Health Clinical Placement Office and industry partners regarding placement with the aims of high quality student placements, working collaboratively to address identified workforce needs, developing innovative partnerships and collaboration between the ACT Health Clinical Placement Officer and industry partners, reviewing feedback from evaluation surveys from students, health facilities and or education providers, and to continually enhance 
the student placement experience. And with these objectives from our industry partner meeting is the reason I'm very excited to active member and be present tonight for the launch of this wonderful innovation. I, I thank you for your time and I, and I wish you this initiative all the, all the best in its endeavours and I'm sure it will achieve uh, a wonderful outcomes for the students, but ultimately for our future workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I've been involved with NPEC now for must be a couple, a couple of years. Um, and getting this off the ground in HESA has been, um, it, it's been a bit of a process, but I would like to um, especially thank uh, Georgina Farga for her assistance in, in assisting with all the legal, um, the legal forms and everything that we had to do in order for HESA to take on um, or for HESA to um, be a partner in NPEC. The board of HESA were really delighted to be involved with NPEC. And I think from, from my perspective, being a, a nurse and also the CEO of AMAC, it was, it's such a pleasure to see a tool where students can provide um, information directly back to the schools of nursing that will serve to improve clinical placements. I think that's one of the, the key things that everybody in, um, in every health profession wants to see is an improvement in education, an improvement in clinical practice, and also um, an improvement in relationships. I um, I concur with, with Simon that 90% um, have satisfactory or a good experience on clinical placement, but it would be lovely to see greater than 99% of students having, having a really good um, clinical practice experience. But we should be aiming, Simon, for 100%, I think, because it is so important for students to have that great experience um, and to be welcomed into the profession along their journey, uh, their student journey. So on behalf of the board of HESA, I would like to, um, to now open the National Placement Evaluation Centre and congratulate everybody who has had significant involvement in setting this up. And uh, the board is delighted to be working with both Federation University and the Council of Deans of Nursing and Midwifery in this exciting project and continuation of student evaluation. So it's now open, open for business, and um, we will look forward to ongoing evaluations. So please join me in, uh, thank you. <laughs> in congratulating the team and congratulating HESA for seeing, um, seeing the possibilities of this in the future. So um, the last or the final part of, of this is um, some questions. Now we've got, we do have some questions. Um, and I'm going to hand over to, um, to Marie Getz to um, moderate the questions that have, uh, that have come through. So Marie, can I hand over to you to, uh, to look at the questions? Thank you. Fantastic, Fiona. Thank you so much. And Simon, 
um, and the whole panel. Can I ask our panel members to please turn on their cameras and microphones? Um, so just reminding everybody in the audience that we do have um, an opportunity for people to pose questions and some of those are coming through at the moment. So I'm going to go through them in order and we do have quite a bit of time. So uh, I guess the first question comes to you, Simon, and it pertains to the application of the tools um, for use in allied health for allied health students. So I'd just like you to comment on that and perhaps other panel members can follow on that. Thank you, Marie and uh, Jana, thank you for the question. Um, the answer is not just yet, but we've already started discussion with um, allied health uh, staff about how we would adapt our existing tool, which shouldn't be too hard to do. So the answer to that one is in the future and perhaps, Marie, if I go to the next question, next question down, which is about nurse practitioner students, not just yet is the straight answer to that one as well. Uh, OK, well, um, the other question, which I think is, is incredibly important and interesting, especially in light of the current workforce issues, is um, the idea about extending the evaluation tool to follow graduates through um, after they've completed mm -hmm. their course. And of course, that's a separate research question, but perhaps I'll throw that one over to Karen to comment on um, as chair of council around the idea that um, we need to look at it, the graduate experience beyond um, yeah. the curriculum and, and any comments from council about that certainly there's been some work that's looking at that in the U, uh, UK and also in the US I'm not aware of anything uh, formally in Australia although I know some colleagues from ANMF are interested in that question yeah I think I think it is a really good question there isn't I think there's not a national approach here in Australia and I think what we find is that there are pockets of where where this is actually working um quite well um it might not be a formalized preceptorship training um but there's you know the new grad programs all have preceptorship with them but not all of our grads get new not all of our graduation graduates uh, have places on the new grad program. Sorry for my stumble there. Um, so I do think you know we need to have preceptorship for every new grad so that it helps to support them in that transitionary transitionary period. Um, developing preceptorship training um, and having qualified preceptors is a requirement in some other countries um, like the UK, uh, but you know there are other countries where it is a requirement where we have those um, qualifications for people who are supervising students. Um, and it does uh, underpin some quality and how to assess students on placement um, and provide some minimum standards. So it would be good to see us maybe uh, work towards something like that in Australia. Yeah, that's a great comment, Carolyn. I guess um, feeding on from that, um, and this is probably a question to Simon, and I'm sure that you've given it um, a lot of consideration, is how, uh, what recommendations do you have around communicating the outcomes of the evaluations to the industry partners? Um, I guess that some of the information could be quite sensitive and we would you know, want to make sure that that was um, focused on a more of a quality improvement along those lines, but uh, what are the strategies that you're thinking about there? We're working towards a system of openness and honesty, Marie. Yeah. Um, the answer to your question is that um, any site can see their own data. So if a university, the University of Melbourne students um, report on placements in the Melbourne region, um, and if those hospitals have uh, accepted and supervised those students. They may also give a placement evaluation as educators. So all will be able to see the ratings um, de-identified of students that have attended. So they can see those at any stage. You cannot see um, uh, other universities or other industry partners specific ratings um, uh, that have been given. However, what, will the, what the centre will do 
Um, at the moment, I think we planned for annually, we will have an annual de-identified report benchmarking placements across the whole country from both nursing students and uh, educators in industry. Um, so that, that will be our plan. I hope that answers the question. So this sort of speaks to the question posed by Tracy Humphrey there in the uh, the question and answer section there around the um, the national like how will this rollout occur from a, a benchmarking perspective? Um, will we have some parameters for doing that, or is that still a work in progress? Yeah, it's it's actually with the it's with the board at the moment um, exactly on what we we'll report and how we we'll report on it. There is a provisional document that the government's uh, board is looking at, I think, next week about how we'll actually specifically and what details we'll reveal about reporting, bearing in mind that we need to be careful about de-identification. And if there was only one university, for example, in the Northern Territory, we'd have to be careful about how we reported on that. And therefore, it may not be state or territory-based reporting. It may be a conglomeration of those. So my short answer to your question is to be confirmed, Marie. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I guess that sort of speaks a little bit more to the second part of what Tracy was talking about. And perhaps Megan, you'd like to comment on this around what are the most important things that the students like to know about clinical placement and mm -hmm. to feed in? What are, what are the things that make, make the difference? What's, what, what are the sorts of quality indicators that are important to you guys? I think for us, what's important is um, definitely supervision and feeling um, feeling accepted by our preceptors and um, given being given new opportunities. Because a lot of the time, as students, we find that they think it's they just see it to be a bit easier and quicker if they do it themselves, and we just watch rather than wow. um, them having the preceptor training to to know that us doing it ourselves, being supervised, is what's what we're going to get out of our placement. If that answers your question. Yeah, that's that's mm. a really good point. I, I think it's really important for we as educators and the universities don't necessarily remember what the most important things are. And the health services themselves also, they want to know how to improve, and it goes back to those, what we say, the qualitative experience, that thing about how you feel and not how you feel if you feel safe and supported mm -hmm. and your learning is supported, then you're more likely to choose that place as in a future employer, right? Yeah, absolutely. Also, um, not to feel like you're a hindrance is a big one too. You're constantly mm -hmm. trying to help and excel and learn and to feel like you're helping your preceptor rather than hindering them by making their shift a bit slower. Or as I said in, um, in my presentation, the preceptors who did have some um, training were brilliant in that regard. They really took the time to explain and, and help me develop my, my quality nursing skills because graduating, you don't wanna feel like you're not ready. You wanna be excited and confident and ready to start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, great points. And and there's another question here, um, and this probably goes to you again, Simon. It's about the clinical facilitators and the sort of feedback that they're looking for. Um, will we as facilitators be able to look at a question or the parameters on placement at all? Um, thanks, Marie. Well, I interpreted that question as will clinical coordinators whether they be professional staff or academic staff will they be able to see reports of students slash placement i hope that's the correct interpretation the answer is yes if they're designated as the key clinical links at that university so the answer to that one is yes depended on um authority right there's a lot of comments coming through in the um Q and A around preceptorship. So um, the comments that Megan has actually made are really speaking volumes to the idea of um, sort of supporting preceptorship programs and development of preceptors. And I guess with the current workforce stresses, it is really difficult for the clinical nurses, you know, in in undertaking the supervision and then 
acting as the educators. So I think that's a, a really important mm -hmm. point. I wonder, Anthony, whether you wanted to comment on models of preceptorship and any thoughts or reflections that you have on that matter. I um I I do think that the comment from Megan is that we need to ensure that um, the staff in the industry are trained in the appropriate assessment of the student and that they have a, an appreciation of the curriculum and the um, outcomes and competencies that they are trying to achieve during the um, uh, clinical placement. Uh, I, I think I'd like to think that we were uh, further advanced and see one, do one, teach one. And so, and it's not everyone's skill, even though I believe it is everyone's role as a nurse or a midwife to teach and, and impart information. It is a skill to support the, uh, the student uh, in the clear clinical arena. I would like to see though that the student is a part of the team and that they work as, as part of the workforce when they are on their clinical placement. And that if they do have a competency such as doing observations on a child who is having ventilin therapy, that it's part of their patient allocation within the team, not solely to uh, do that um, skill I or, or that um, um, a, a requirement of their clinical placement. I think from COVID-19 and the and the beauty and wisdom that the student brought to the table to be a part of the um, workforce in relation to inf infection prevention and control and vaccination, that it really highlighted how the student can be a part of of, of the workforce, but I do think that the, that the student needs to, in their third year, have a full appreciation of the different ways of working within, within the clinical arena, whether that be total patient care, patient allocation, or team nursing. But it is integral and vital that the student is a part of the team and the ways of working of that ward, in my opinion. Fantastic, <laughs> Anthony, and Karen's keen to make comment now as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I think Anthony has really expressed that really eloquently. I just wanted to comment on, you know, the workforce challenges that we have right now. You know, I, I attended a, a big round table earlier this week for the Department of Health, which is all different healthcare uh, peak bodies trying to discuss solutions to the current workforce crisis. And one of those solutions is that we need to train more nurses. We need to educate more nurses. And that puts, you know, significant demand on supervision in the clinical areas. And we know that there isn't enough staff in the clinical areas and that they're fatigued, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that we did talk about was the fact that some people just want, you know, they, they want to continue nursing or being a midwife, but they're just exhausted and they're leaving because of that, you know, because of those issues. But perhaps these are people that we can talk to about, yeah. can we retain you in a clinical preceptor role? Yeah. Um, so that we've got them in, the, in that and increase our capacity for supporting students in the clinical in the clinical environments, whilst not placing that additional burden on the, you know, on the students, uh, on the staff in the, in the areas and giving students a really good dedicated uh, education experience, but within the context of holistic care so that we're not doing, you know, what, what uh, uh, Anthony highlighted there, you know, and fragmenting it and being very task focused. And I think, I think that's something that we could look at rather than letting very experienced nurses and midwives walk out of the workforce because they've not, you know, they've been exhausted over this past two and a half mm -hmm. years and they just can't see a way of continuing. But that wealth of expertise we can use in different ways that actually might retain them and help boost the capacity of our workforce. Absolutely. And I think the, the literature around um, well-being shows that um, nurses rate uh, continuing professional education and support as the yeah. most highly um, yeah. important variables affecting their you know, their work, yeah. their intention to stay in the profession. Mm -hmm. So really good points made there. Mm -hmm. um, now, Simon, you know, some some of the other disciplines are vying in and our midwifery colleagues and asking, can we just please confirm that midwifery is also being evaluated here or? 
Um, they definitely are. Um, Marie, we will be starting uh, using the trial version of PET Middle 3. Um, we've already started using it. Um, we have about 60 or 70 students who've responded using that tool. Um, so we'll be validating that and rolling them out appropriately in the near future. And while I'm on, if I can answer Ken Griffin's question, which is very astute, the last one, which is, has consideration begin to not have anonymity, if I can say, in the research survey results when somebody's been in primary care? This is, was extensive conversation with, between us. If a student is sent to a general practice, um, there may be only one or two students that go to that practice in any one year. So it would be impossible to de-identify them. So our plan is to only release results um, on a placement where seven or more in one calendar year have attended. I hope that answers Ken question, Ken's question. That's great. And uh, Karen, you're going to answer a question here um, from Gabrielle. Oh, um, yeah, I thought I could type it in, um, but it was just uh, that, yes, we, we're seeking to, yeah, we are seeking to extend uh, the, the PET tool to enrolled nurses as well, but we've not done that quite yet. But maybe Simon um, wants to pick up on that in more detail. Um, uh, just to follow on from what Karen's just said, um, it's the next rollout. Let's just put it like that. So we're starting with nursing. We'll roll in um, midwifery in detail over the next year. And hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to roll out to enrolled nurses as well. And then on to the other health professions. Mm. Just pick up on the, uh, there's a question there from Louise Allen um, that's asking about um, supervisor preparation and our discussions around how we train preceptors. But at the other end of the spectrum, um, there's a discussion or a question posed as do we think that students need better preparation for placement? And of course, um, the work that we've done um, in collaboration with the Council of Deans in another study Karen referred to did indicate that there were certain things that needed to be done for students in preparing for placement. So we do have evidence that that is indeed true. So there might be some triangulation of data, but I might put that question to Megan and what you think about that in terms of what are the things that are really important in preparation for going out on placement? Any reflections or comments you'd like to make on that? Um, one thing I've probably noticed recently with a placement in an emergency department is in second year and first semester of third year, we go through a lot of pathophysiology and, um, and those who are de deteriorating patients. And I found going back, although I've previously done that study, going back and just getting a refresh on nursing care and interventions and medications really prepared me and blood results and things and understanding what they were really prepared me for this placement because they'd show me a lot of a lot of the patient's information and they'd say and what are you going to do and luckily because I just refreshed um, I was able to have a general idea which meant I wasn't standing there a bit a bit dumbfounded with as a third year student so I think for students, we're given, you know, we have great lab times and, and classes that prepare us for placement. But, um, yeah, going and doing your own refresh on your knowledge, I think, is really important. Or if, if you see something on clinical placement, instead of not asking what it means, um, asking them, sorry, I don't know what that abbreviation is or what's the care, I think we also... It's not our responsibility just to follow our preceptor around. We also need to seek our own, our own information and come home and maybe re re look over um, patients' conditions mm. to learn more, to absorb and understand what's happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic, Megan. And I think there is work um, that council can do to help support, you know, some standards around what students can do to prepare for placement. That's definitely some work from the university's perspective that can be explored. 
There's a number of comments um, also, and I guess this is one that we could, I guess, wrap up with. Um, and it goes to you, Simon, of course, and it's about you know, the future state of the, the research and evidence. Where would you like to take this work in terms of, um, I guess, quality improvement? Um, how will we know um, that this is a success and what are the things that we need to do to sustain it? Oh, well, the world is our oyster as researchers of this, um, which is why it's been so exciting so far. Mm. Well, I'll just add that obviously we started by um, uh, designing an appropriate assessment tool. When we started doing this a few years ago, we found 10 student placement evaluation tools across the world, mm. and none of them quite fitted what we wanted to do, um, mm. possibly because um, uh, they were produced in different cultures and communities. And so hence, that's why we ended up producing our own tool. We need to validate that tool um, in, uh, properly in both midwifery and the other professions and with enrolled nurses, um, because in, to, in order to answer the question um, and to uh, respond to the aim of improving clinical placement across Australia, we do need a good, solid assessment measure. So from there on, clearly we're going to look at student placements, educators' placements, and design interventions to fill the gaps where there is gaps. Mm -hmm. um, that leads me on to one of our biggest other aims, which is led um, by Colleen, um, our deputy director, is about what we shall do um, mm -hmm. around appropriate interventions for enhancing clinical placement experiences. Um, so leave it with us. It'll be time um, to build up appropriate interventions, um, appropriate models. Um, but I expect in the next year or so we'll be able to start some interventional work. I hope that answers that question. Fantastic. Well, um, there are a number of other questions that we haven't got time to ask because we're nearly at time. However, it is um, important that we get back to you. Uh, this event obviously has been recorded and we're going to send out some post-event um, evaluation. So we'd like to hear from you, but we'll also um, provide information so that you can do further reading, trying to respond to those questions that we haven't been able to answer live. I want to um, now uh, finish up, but I'll probably hand just back over to Fiona now just to um, close our session. Uh, thank you, Marie, and thank you very much for doing that session so well, and thank you to the panel. Um, I um, That was extremely interesting, and I was watching all the questions go up, and we got to about 30, 35 questions. So there's obviously a lot of interest. Um, just as a, a quick aside, I went to a clinical placement roundtable in Victoria where they were looking at how to improve clinical placements and um, with a view to putting more funds into clinical mm -hmm. placement. So obviously this is on the table and I'm really hoping that MPEC will feed into future thinking about clinical placements and it won't just be how can we reduce clinical placements. So look, thank you very much to everybody who's contributed tonight. I'd just like to thank Sabrina and the University of Melbourne for um, the technical support and putting this together. But um, especially the panel and the HESA board for making this possible. Um, so thank you all very much. And uh, I look forward to engaging you more in this uh, fabulous project. So thank you.